Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Goldshore Resources Live Summit today, hosted by SIX. I'm very pleased to introduce Brett Richards, Goldshore CEO and Director. Brett's going to walk us through a company pres presentation, and then we will be accepting questions live. So you can submit your questions at any time on the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll try to get to them after the presentation is over. And as always, the summit's being recorded and available to watch afterwards on SIX.com. But without any further ado, Brett, I'll pass it to you to kick it off. Thanks, Dasha, and thanks everyone for taking the time to uh, to hear the presentation. This is really just an update as to uh, an extension of kind of the last presentation we, we gave here at SIX, and, uh, and really to highlight some of the things we're working on in the spring and summer and fall in the months to come. <clears throat> I direct everyone's attention to our disclaimers and forward-looking statements. You'll find them on our website uh, at uh, goldshoreresources.com. As I have said for, from, from some time, I, I was interested in this project because I felt that it had potential. I felt that it had lots of upside as from a resource standpoint. And, you know, it's how we entered into the transaction. It's why we entered into such a big program and our capital raising last year. And, you know what, if nothing else, I still hold that view is that, you know, this has tremendous potential. To the, to the point where I think we, we can create the next tier one asset in Ontario. So a tier one asset is defined by, by the majors, but they say they, they, they look for 10 million ounce deposits with 10 year mine lives and big production profiles of 500,000 ounces uh, per annum or greater. And, and they need to be lower half of the cost curve. And by, by designating uh, this as a tier one asset, um, or the, the criteria for a tier one asset, it means these mines are generational. They're around for 20 or 30 years because of the size and scale of them. As everyone will know, we, we put together a pretty extensive team of people to you know get the story out there and, and to support the project uh, along the way. We are in Ontario and we are starting with a 4 million ounce historical resource. And this is the starting point I'm gonna talk about the economics of uh, quite shortly. We're well into our 100,000 meter program. We're about 21,000 meters into it. And we will get through this program this year. Uh, and we are kind of ramping up to, uh, to seven or eight rigs uh, by July and eight to 10 rigs by, uh, by August. Uh, we're gonna get through this program as quickly as possible. So we can unlock that potential. And I, and I, I need to, to, to kind of raise this last point as well. We've raised $50 million in the last 18 months, and, and that's material. And I can say there aren't very many junior mining companies who have been able to raise that level of money over, the, the, over the, that period of time. And quite frankly, um, you know, it was in a very, very difficult market last year and, and continues to be difficult this year. But we have tremendous shareholder support, and, and, and I want to thank our shareholders for that. As you know, the team is is quite small. It's limber. Uh, it's limber. Um, it's myself. I've been in this business for around 35 years, probably closer to 36. I need to update my buy health. But uh, I've worked for majors. I've I've started companies. I've run billion dollar operating companies with multiple mines. Pete Flindell has been with me for almost 20 years. Uh, he's been with me as a senior executive in all of my companies as the lead geologist. He is a world-renowned um, VP of exploration, world-renowned ge geologist, and, and he understands uh, this style of uh, mineralization quite well. Mara Yassin is uh, our CFO. Uh, she works out of Vancouver. And then we have a, a, a fairly serious board of, of CFOs, CEOs, and and individuals who can really kind of tell the story and get behind the story and a balance between kind of youth and, and, and old guys like me, but a balance between uh, kind of the age demographic because we all target different audiences and, and these guys with, uh, with uh, who run their own companies, uh, whether it's Galen, who's our chairman or, or Sean or Brandon or Victor or others, you know, and Doug, you know, that we all, have different reach. We all have different resources and investor bases. So I use their, their collective network to get our story out there as I do our advisory board who, you know, well-known groups of guys who, who have got behind the story because they see the same thing as me. They believe in it. They see the potential, they see the size and they see the scale. Now we need to unlock that potential. And 
you know, Gold Shore is a low-grade kind of um, bulk tonnage style deposit. It's it's mirroring the likes of kind of a detour, which uh, uh, was a uh, you know acquired by Kirkland Lake and then merged with uh, Agnico back in November. But we're on that that same pathway. We have the land package to support a much larger resource, and I'm going to show that to you a little later. But I'm going to jump right into the economics because in 2013. Moss Lake Gold Mines did a PEA or a preliminary economic analysis of the of the asset, <clears throat> and they had four million ounces uh, in their resource statement. They pulled uh, everything measured, indicated, and inferred into a uh, a model. That model uh, had three million ounces contained uh, as far as the input goes. So that's what got pulled into the mining shell, as we call it, and two and a half million ounces uh, came out. Um, based on 85% recovery uh, in the QES zone and 80% recovery in the main zone. So around 250,000 ounces of production a year for 10 years and $922 cash costs, which is lower half of the cost curve. And I make those statements because when I go back to the framework for a tier one asset, you'll, you'll recall I talked about 10 million ounces, 200, 500,000 ounce profile, 10 year plus mine life, and lower half of the cost curve. We have the makings of this, and this is what we're starting from. This is our starting point before we add any ounces to it. But the economic outputs of this base case, 2013, updated and in 2020 from the historical resource, the base case was run at 1546 gold and has an NPV of $334 million. And companies like ours trade on a valuation about 0.3 times NPV at this stage of development. And you can see today we're up at around $1,900 gold. Um, when I did the slide, it was $1,950, but, you, but it, you can see it's pulled back a bit. But my view, again, I, you know, I'm, I can go back to January of 2021. My view is gold's going to trade between $1,800 and $2,200. I, I stay steadfast on that range. We've stayed within that range for the last eight, 15, 16 months. <clears throat> we have gone outside of it once uh, in both directions, but it's come right back into this range. <clears throat> so I see the potential for, for new shareholders getting in at $1,900 gold. Our starting point is an $800 million after-tax NPV. That's a $240 million market cap company. Today, we're at 60. So there's a lot of growth, four times uh, growth to grow into the economic valuation of the resource we're starting with. And that's before we add anything to it. So I say that because this is important. The market will calibrate us along the way. It's just that our trajectory will be much higher as we get to put out a resource statement that we have achieved our goal of, of tier one status and a PEA to support that on a much larger base. There won't be a 300 million, 3 million ounce input. It'll be much larger than that. And I, and I don't know how much larger than that, but I'll, I'll start to show you some graphically kind of what that looks like. But again, you can see the potential. And if, if you think gold's gonna go up to 2000 or $2,100, uh, you know, we've got a potential for a $280, $300 million market cap company, which is a $2 share price today. And we're trading at kind of in and around 50 cents. So four times money on, on our economics. And when you translate that into our peer comparison, and I've showed this slide many times, we've updated it up to uh, April the 20th, so a week ago. We've pulled back a little bit. We're probably more like $15 an ounce or $14 an ounce or $60 million cap. <clears throat> but our peers have kind of stayed robust. And the mean of our peer group is around $45. So again, from a trading perspective to our peers, we have a four times multiple to get up to our mean. So this really, again, describes the shareholder potential or the investor investment potential of coming into Gold Shore today. Um, cap structure, <clears throat> We three weeks ago, we announced a uh, financing for $10 million, uh, and we, we ha now have that in Treasury. We have $20 million in the bank, which is going to go well down the road in our program. I talked uh, um, a little bit about accelerating our program in the news. 
yesterday. And it's our intention to kind of ramp up the spring summer um, to not only get through our program, but get through everything, metallurgical test work, get, get, get through everything we can so that we have all of the data we need by the end of the year to do the resource estimation update, as well as the, um, the, the new PEA we're going to do in Q1 next year. <clears throat> the project, uh, and you know, I look at these things as uh, from project viability. How many boxes does this tick? Are we in the Northern Arctic? Do I have to fly everything up there? Are, you know, are we gonna have to use diesel power for fuel? How are we gonna get people up there? Well, we, we answer all those questions. Our location is, you know, prime location for building a district scale mining camp. And this region has been underexplored, underdeveloped, underdrilled. Um, because of its low grade nature, one, 1.2, 1.3 grams a ton has not been economic at a thousand dollar gold or $1,200 gold or even $1,300 gold prices. You just couldn't build a project on the back of it. But at $1,800 gold prices, you see, you can see from our economic analysis, how robust this is and going forward, you know, bringing more size of that nature and of, of uh, deposit to the table is going to deliver some some tremendous economic output results when we do our PEA. But we are right near Young Street, Highway 11, the Trans-Canada Highway, four-lane highway, major power corridor from Ontario Hydro and Hydro One. We have 10 cent kilowatt hour power going right by our doorstep. We have CNCP rail. We have, as I said, four-lane highway, access to contractors, access to people, government in Thunder Bay, 120 kilometers away. We have water, we have uh, uh, natural gas supplies. We have everything to build a district scale mining camp. And that should not be underestimated because these are the boxes that somebody will tick when evaluating the viability of our project. I have put the historical drill results up in the past and I've talked about them. We're getting kind of that very similar correlation at Moss Lake but I really want to get out into Iris Lake and East Coldstream and Hamlin Lake. And I'm going to show you graphically in a second why. This was a drill result that we put out, 58.8 meters at six grams. One of the highest grade uh, holes I've seen this year in the junior space in Ontario. And it's from 100 meters. So this is all open pitable material. The entire hole here is 274 meters deep and, uh, and, and runs about a gram. So. So great mineralization, some high grade shoots here, four meters at 61 grams and nine meters at 8.7 grams. Really, really good, strong high grade material here that you know, will bring optionality down the road. If we find more of these, there could be potential starter pits and, and it all forms into kind of the basis of the project at the end of the day. Um, we're, we still got a bit of snow up, uh, up at uh, Moss Lake, up at our camp, but again, we are right, you know, right at site. We have uh, continued to, to advance and develop our ESG profile, both with the discussions and relationships we have with our uh, Indigenous uh, um, uh, groups on our First Nations host communities. Um, and again, we still expect to have an exploration agreement with our host community to be signed this quarter. But our focus is not just on our Indigenous groups. And yeah, yes, we do provide employment opportunities and priorities to them and contracting priorities to them. But we also have expanded, and Pete has done a really good job interfacing with the community in Thunder Bay and also interfacing with uh, Lakehead University and various educational institutes. Primary Head, um, and, um, and we're going to be attending the Thunder Bay Minerals Conference uh, in the next couple of months. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the, the collaboration that, that Pete has uh, uh, worked on and, and uh, supporting the local community has been quite tremendous. And, and we also are carrying on with our environmental baseline study and getting through uh, the, the key points of that so that we can, we can uh, quickly um, get through the environmental impact assessment when we go to kind of permit this in a couple of years time. So I'm going to show you now, I've talked a lot in the past about the VTEM survey and, and about what that means at the end of the day. And I'm going to show um, it, it graphically to you because this survey has revealed 29 previously undrilled high priority targets uh, that expands kind of our 
uh, our view of this, and it just uh, it just continues to support the the original view that that I had. So, this is kind of our land package. We have defined three different domains here: conductors on the east domain and conductors on the west domain, with a whole central area of the central domain having completely different kind of signatures, more of a mag low signature where we have mag highs um, in the east and west domain, more conductors uh, versus resistors and different chargeability. And, and when I kind of look, pull in Moss Lake here, and you can see <clears throat> Moss Lake is kind of hosted, the mineralization is hosted through the, the, these blue, through these diorite intrusions up against kind of a, a folded, uh, you know, these folded magnetite and sulfide chirts. Um, but the, the, the historic mineralization is right here. And again, this is just our land package. So these drill results here, the red illustrates, uh, you know, uh, intercepts of greater than one gram, the, the yellow and orange less than one gram, but above cutoff. And you can see there's three distinct areas. There's an area up in the north here. There's an area kind of to the north northwest, which is the main zone. And there's a small little area down here. And when we model this, it looks something like this. It's, uh, <clears throat> this is three and a half million out of the four million ounces. And this has its own distinct um, chargeability, has its own distinct uh, IP or geophysical signature. And when we had techno imaging take that exact um, a geophysical signature and extrapolate that over our land package so we can see where we have the exact same mineralization elsewhere in our land package, you find it here. And, and this is when I talk about the size and scale and potential of Moss Lake, this is it. This is the historic three and a half million ounces. And we're going to be kind of looking to go into this pod here and this folded nose, and this pod here, and this folded nose, and we're going to be trying to bring as much of this into a new resource as possible. <clears throat> and why am I so confident? Is because there is a lot of drill holes out through this area where it is mineralized, and we're getting 1.2 grams over 150 meters, and it just didn't get pulled into the resource because of the spacing. It's too far away of the existing resource or where the, the concentration of drilling was, so it never got pulled into the resource. So not only do we have drill data, data for it, and we know it's mineralized, we also can see it now from its distinct IP, its distinct geophysical signature. So this gives me a lot of confidence that this two and a half kilometers is going to expand. This is 11 kilometers here that we are going to be able to expand. It goes all the way up to the north here, you know, almost 20 kilometers, but this is, this is going to give me confidence that we will achieve our goals. Again, it's about execution. We gotta get, we gotta get drill holes spaced close enough so that we can get pulled into the resource and then hang it all together on a project pitch shell. But we have 11 brand new gold targets. And I didn't even talk about the one down to the Southwest here. There's a large one down here uh, and then one embedded in the Hamlin Lake deposit. But that's not all, you know, we have East Coldstream also has a half a million ounces of historical resource. And we take that geophysical signature and extrapolate it over our land package. And we can see the exact same signature in six brand new areas that we need to test. <clears throat> and, and then we talk about, I want to talk about North Coldstream. We've done some work on it because there's been a historic mine here. And it ran in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s. <clears throat> and, and in 1982, uh, 1992, it was closed by Extrata um, simply because the copper price was too low. And they used to make a copper, gold, silver con here, uh, concentrate. And again, we've modeled the historic production. It's, it's quite uh, low. It was in an adit. So they went in a little, for layman's terms, they went in a tunnel and kept going deeper in the tunnel. And, and it was just a small operation but it has its own IP signature as well. And we've modeled it here and there's still a little bit of ore, probably, well, a lot of ore still left here, but the takeaway for me is that IP signature, that geophysical signature extrapolated over our entire property looks like this. And that is very, very significant because 
this area down in, in Hamlin is just popping out like uh, like uh, something else. This area in the middle, uh, adjacent Moss Lake, up against this, this magnetite, these uh, sulfide cherts as well, um, is also, um, you know, has the same signature. But it's never been drilled. We've never drilled these two up in the northwest. <clears throat> so we have a, a lot, I have a lot of uh, excitement here for what this copper gold uh, target is going to look like. In North Coldstream, we also uh, assayed some of the historic core, and we found anywhere from 0.1 to 0.5% cobalt. And that, again, is a game changer because 0.5% cobalt is a mine in itself. Um, and, <clears throat> again, we're, we're, we have to figure all of this out ge geologically in order to see whether there's consistency in it. But, again, really, really encouraging results here. So <clears throat> when I take all of this out and lay it all out in, in, in our land package. We have 29 brand new targets that uh, we need to get through between now and the end of the year. You're gonna be seeing a lot of drill results come out between now and, next, and now and Christmas. <clears throat> so the key timeline for us is quite simple. We're gonna drill up until the end of the year and we're gonna continue to drill beyond that. But we're gonna start the resource update, uh, the, uh, the estimation update in Q4. Uh, and we're going to kind of run it, take its course. We're going to do a number of permutations on it. But when we have, you know, a, a core resource that we can use in a PEA, we will start that process. And it will take around three or four months to, to do a PEA so that at the end of Q1 next year, we're going to be sitting here and we're going to be talking about the economic outputs of a much larger resource in a brand new. And then I put on the bottom here, what I, what I think, what I call a, a corporate decision point. We need to then make some decisions. And although I'll be preparing for those decisions in advance of uh, the end of Q1, we need to understand where we go from here. And the, and, and the option I have talked about the most is an alternative to partner with somebody who has the balance sheet, who has the, I'll say the financial team capacity, has the project team capacity and the construction team and the operating team to put this into production for a long period of time. Will we be looking for that type of partnership uh, in some form of M&A or earn in or farm out? Uh, and the answer is yes. We'll be looking to try and give our shareholders um, an off-ramp or some sort of liquidity event to realize the value that we will create. And I fully appreciate that we haven't created any value from our IPO. In fact, the market has been very punitive to gold companies over the last 15 months uh, and continues to be very punitive. Even in this big macro situation where we have this geopolitical tension uh, between Russia, the Ukraine, but really the rest of the world, <clears throat> we have China sitting there watching um, and we have, we have North Korea sitting there watching and we have the U.S. trying to play a bit of a backstop to supply and, and, and support to Ukraine, as is the EU. This is a situation that has progressively got worse. This war has created a lot of market uncertainty. There's a lot of risk off right now. And the dynamics are, are, quite, uh, are quite unique. And, and we are in a market now that is, is very, very challenging. And on the economic front, we are in a hyperinflationary environment, 7 8% inflation currently, and the outlook for the remainder of the year goes to a maximum of 10, and you've got a lot of dysfunctional kind of, let's call them monetary policies as a result of that. The 10-year treasury at almost 3% with 8% inflation to minus 5% yield, that's not sustainable. There will be outflows of capital, that leave those sectors and those sectors impacted by inflation and a hundred and hundred dollar oil today, but you know, potentially going to 130 or $150 oil. There are, there are asset classes that are very negatively affected by uh, the hyperinflationary environment. We're going to see a rotation of capital out of those. Traditionally that rotation of capital has come into a safe haven. It's come into you know, precious metals, specifically gold as a storage of value while, you know, while economies and countries and investors ride this out. Because in a volatile market, you, you need some sort of storage of wealth 
because on, in a negative yield bond environment, in a negative yield savings environment, and a very volatile equity environment, it's very, <coughs> excuse me, it's very difficult to preserve value. And that's why I think gold shore is a leverage play to the gold price. <clears throat> it's a leverage play to the size and scale of what we, what we have potential to achieve. And we're not, it's not being reflected in our share price, but it will. It's just a matter of time. These things will normalize. We will calibrate to our economics. We will calibrate to our peer group. It's just simply a matter of time. And we need to put our execute execute as fast as we can. And that's my mantra is getting us to speed to market is, is one of my, my mantras you'll hear often. But but I but I wanna I wanna get through this program as fast as possible to understand and realize what that potential looks like. Because there are very similar companies to us trading at two, three hundred million dollar market cap with resources much less than what I think we're going to achieve at the end of the day. So there again, it's about investment potential, it's about entry point, and, and I think this is the, the entry point for us. So, you know, I, I, I think we, we tick a lot of boxes here. Um, I've talked about them all today. And the way forward is just consistency. We're seeing consistent results in drilling. We're seeing consistent correlation to the historic resource. And the uh, results from the VTEM survey have been tremendous in us trying to, you know, validate what we think and validate our, our the thesis and our concept on this. And the investment thesis will follow along as we get through a PEA and as we can demonstrate the value of this project, it will be attractive to many, many gold companies. And, uh, and it's why I say we'll come to this corporate decision point uh, around this time next year. And um, we'll, uh, we'll make some decisions as to how we move forward. But my, my first and foremost priority here is about creating shareholder value and also about realizing shareholder value. We can realize it in, in, a, in some form of event that I think that is gonna be you know, first prize for, for all of Gold Shore shareholders. And if we continue on and we continue to create more value beyond that, that's great too. I just think that um, you know, the, the, uh, the most amount of value is created in the shortest period of time. And it is, uh, I'm not, it's not, I'm not magic. This is the Lasson curve. And at this stage to the next stage we're going to be to is when you create the most value in a company. So, you know, I, I just, I think that, uh, as I said, I think we tick a lot of boxes and this is one really good, great entry point for, for shareholders looking for relief from this volatility and looking for relief from, you know, uh, looking at the markets all day long. I think this is, this is what we'll, uh, this is what we'll, um, we'll deliver for, for shareholders. So Dasha, that's uh, really it. I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, great, thank you. There's a few questions here. Lots of support. I, thanks for all the support, everybody. And there's lots of lots of people here, uh, you know, supporting the, um, uh, you know, certainly supporting the, uh, the the project and and the and the and the presentation. So so thank you for that. One of the questions here talks about um, talks about the current environment and and why we announced that we're going to accelerate um, why we are going to accelerate our program. And I think um, uh, I, I think you know we have enough treasury right now that that we're able to kind of ramp up and and <clears throat> these kind of situations don't don't last forever. And I think we're going to be well positioned um, and coming out of the summer <clears throat> and and into the fall, knowing kind of the size and scale uh, of the resource. So I, I think there's there's very limited risk in in ramping up to six, seven, eight drill rigs at this stage, there's a lot of drilling companies that are preserving cash. And I get that. You know, if you got a million bucks in the bank or two million bucks in the bank, then preserve your cash and try and ride this out. Uh, but you're not creating value. And I don't want to stop creating value for the sake of, of, um, uh, of, of what's going on around us. What's going on around us is going to go on for some time. And, you know, I... I had a lot of shareholder support to um, to um, uh, to raise the ten million dollars back in March and, and early close in early April. So I think um, I think we're well positioned with our balance sheet. We're well positioned to ramp this up, and uh, yeah, I'm quite happy to uh, to uh, to watch this closely 
but uh, to be very cautious and be and, and very, very humble as we move forward. Great. Thank you. So uh, Mark's asking, are the dire diorites and charts vis visually distinct? Um, are they easy to follow the structures? I think they're easy to follow the structures because I think the way techno imaging ha has done this, we can certainly see it in the, the lithology as we are logging core, <clears throat> but you can, you can actually see it in the chargeability uh, and the response back from the survey. So it is actually fairly easy to, to detect um, and follow and, and it's modeled quite well. I just think that this has never been done. Nobody's d done any geophysical airborne survey over the property. And I think they, they were probably working on, on um, their drill targets through topography and mapping and you know other kind of exploration means, geochem, et cetera. And they kind of missed it. And, 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 they, and they missed it because you know, doing a comprehensive program is quite expensive. This VTEM survey was quite expense, expensive, but it gave us that, that map that is, you know, perfectly aligned with what our thinking was. So, so oh, hopefully that answers the question. We have a very detailed answer to uh, the VTEM survey on our website in a press release that I think was put out on March 10th. Got it. Thank you. Uh, next question here is, how are you able to ramp up your program when you hear about all the kinds of shortages with labor, machines, rigs, all of that? <clears throat> yeah, um, it's a great question. I, I tried to answer it earlier. Um, there was, you know, somebody asked me, oh, how can you do this in this economic environment when, when things are so bad and markets are off so much? And, and the reality is, you know, we have the balance sheet to stay the course for the next eight months. Um, and I'll watch this month by month and yeah, maybe we'll change gears and slow it down a bit. But our plan was to ramp up to this. Our plan was to get through the 100,000 meters this year. And by the, the fact that everyone else is shutting down and there's drill rigs coming available, there's people coming available, very good people becoming available. So I think that this is an opportunity. And when markets are at its most difficult, sophisticated investors find opportunity and this is where great wealth is made great money is made at the bottom of the market when things that appear to be the worst that they are it is when you know sophisticated investors enter and make a lot of money when people are trying to look for a flight to safety investors are coming into stuff that they think that can do multiples through this uh, period so for us it's an opportunity because there's equipment, there's supply chain, there's people available, we're gonna use that. But hey, I'm, I'm cautious, okay? I, I'm gonna do this month by month. We're gonna walk this through. If things get worse, we'll calibrate accordingly. I'm not, I'm not reckless. I, I, just, I just wanna take advantage of this opportunity. Right, thank you. Um, John's asking, are there any drill holes outstanding to be announced soon? <laughs> too, there's too many drill holes outstanding to be announced uh, and, uh, and I apologize for that we're going to have a release out probably next week um, we should get it done and get out next week um, you know we're still very happy with what the results look like it's getting them turned around uh, in the time period we need to we have made some kind of changes um, we've mitigated the situation a little bit um, and it's still live, so I can't get into it too much, but what we're trying to do is get assays turned around more like six, six eight weeks. Right now we're getting 16 weeks, 14 weeks. Um, it is still difficult out there. Um, initially we got quick turnaround because we paid for it. I didn't want to pay for it anymore. So, so I thought maybe there'd just be a regular stream and there will be a regular stream coming in soon. We hope to get press releases out every three to four weeks on drill results. So maybe maybe three or four holes a week for or, or three or four holes every press release com coming up. Great, thank you. Um, Chris is wondering how much potential do you see for the high grade part? Sorry, I missed that, uh, Dasha. How much potential do you see for the high grade part? Chris is asking. <clears throat> yeah, good, good question. Uh, um, I think we're gonna be targeting um, on the north side, we're gonna be targeting um, uh, some areas that we what, that we think are high grade shoots uh, based on the the survey that I showed you, um, and we have that survey in a little bit more detail than than what I showed you. 
So we think we've got some, some good correlation. We've got some good high probability areas. Where, where that will lead to, and again, this is very speculative. It's why we're trying to target them. Grade drives a lot of things. And the higher the grade, the more tonnage you can pull in. Uh, so that's a, a size thing. But higher grade starter shoots, uh, uh, starter pits can also drive you know, the economics and bring cash flow forward quickly. And those are, those are, it's very attractive to try and find them. Yes, we're going to target them, but it's not the sole thing we're doing. We're not looking for, you know, we're, we're not looking for that flash in a pan with another, you know, six meters at 61 grams or, 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 um, we're not, we're not just looking for that. We're not, we're, what we're looking for is consistency. And if we can find the high grade shoots along the way, I think it'll help with um, with the economics and, and it'll help with the mind planning when we get to put a mind plan around this. Great. Um, Robert's wondering, what about a possible copper play? Yeah, originally I said, you know, that this had the potential of maybe be a copper spin out. And, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it doesn't. What I'm saying is that every gold company is a copper company too. Every every one of them, they always they all have to deal with copper. Some of them have copper businesses. First Quantum Barrick, they have large copper businesses. Others have copper gold projects, and others have copper gold by, uh, gold copper as a byproduct. So you know, is the sum of the parts going to be more valuable than the actual parts? I don't know the answer to that yet. Let's get through our program and let's see. Um, I, I think these copper gold. Uh, possibly cobalt up at North Coldstream. I think these opportunities, we, we need to drill them. So I can't give you my view until we drill them, <clears throat> but we need to drill them. But, you know, from, from everything we've seen, uh, they are going to be very exciting and, and meaningful. Thank you. Um, Sandeep would like to know the correlation between high chargeability, low resistivity, and EM conductors in the case of copper and gold. <laughs> In our area, in our western domain, our eastern domain, we have we have you know high big conductors there, so big carbon and and big conductors there uh, with low chargeability. In the central zone, we have more of more resistors with high chargeability, and again, we have because we have this lovely footprint of historical drilling, we're able to kind of correlate that very quickly with 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 where mineralization lies and. It was. It's quite easy to to identify what that looks like in these in these intrusions. It's very easy to identify it and then extrapolate it over the entire uh, land package. So that that's easily enough done. But it is it is more. It's it, it geophysical analysis is a little bit outside of my pay grade. This is this is probably more for for Pete to describe. Um, but when we get into ore bodies that are very structurally controlled, like this one is. Then you know th this is VTEM surveys are very very useful, but you know there's a, 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 there's a number of other facets that you have to pull all in. This is this is about data collection, data analysis, and and coming you know having geological theories and then working with that and either satisfying them or you know or or, or terminating them. And I think everything that we've done so far, Pete has uh, has had this theory about what this looks like structurally in this corridor. And he's been pretty bang on, and 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 we're bringing in experts, as you saw in the press release. We're bringing in Brett Davis and Brett and Pete uh, and 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 myself. We we have worked together in the past, and we were we've worked in some of the most difficult structural environments in the world. Uh, one being in the DRC, another one being in West Africa, and um, and and Brett was able to not only figure it out. He he's there, and he trains your people to to how he thinks structurally and, and from a structural basis so it is geophysical it is structural and you know going forward it's going to be uh, it's that that's going to be the basis of providing us uh, the um, the the probability in our results thank you uh we have a question here can you give an overview of the met testing we can expect in the updated pea Yeah, absolutely. So metallurgical testing is, is, is quite simple and it's quite complicated. <laughs> it, uh, what we're trying to understand is how the, the gold liberates from the host rock. And there's a number of, 
Um, I'll say types of geology. So we're coming up with a, a number of geometallurgical domains. I think there's 22 of them. And then we're going to isolate them so, so that we can understand the metallurgical properties of each of them through bottle roll testing. So leaching the actual ore in a bottle roll and, and finding out what the recoveries are. And then assimilating each of those geometallurgical domains uh, into what, how that represents the population of our ore body so that we can bring up that 80 to 85 percent recovery to something that's more closer to what will be actual and in our view that's north of 90 percent which is free upside to our to our economics so there there is a lot of work it's it's there's a lot of repetitive work that needs to be done and and then we'll be doing size distribution so we'll be doing kind of crushing grinding and 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 size distribution of, of ore so we can get the uh, grind size correct. Probably going to be 75 microns, but we need to prove all of that stuff up. So there's just liberation testing and leach testing along the way so that we can design a plant. When we do a new one or a PEA, we'll design a plant that is supported by the metallurgical test work. So primary crushing, secondary crushing and grinding, and then leach um, leachability and, and what the, the leach circuit will look like, the time and resonance, uh, et cetera, so that we can maximize recoveries and get the most output. Um, thanks, question here from Ben. If the goal is to achieve 10 million ounces, will the majority of it be included in the upcoming PEA or is a significant portion too low grade and deep to be mined economically? Um, yeah, so there, there is a, a real balance here. Um, when you're drilling, we can drill this out and, 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 you know, wave our arms and say we got 10 million ounces. But if it's not an economical 10 million ounces, it doesn't make sense. So we're trying to drill this with the, the probability that most of what we're drilling is going to come into the pit shell and come into the actual resource, whether it be in indicated or in inferred is gonna rely on spacing, but we do have some historic results. We can triangulate off of those historic results and we're gonna have step out areas where we go outside the existing resource laterally and along strike. And you saw the, the lovely diagram in 3D there where we have historical holes that we need to kind of infill in order to bring that data into the resource. So the thinking is more lateral than it is at depth or vertical. I don't want to have a, uh, a two kilometer by half kilometer pit that's 700 meters deep. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it won't be economic. Uh, I need something that has some strike to it, that has some width to it, maximum width to it, and then bring in the resource at depth as large enough to, to make it economic or to support a project. So this is about making something at this stage thinking about what that's going to look like in real terms in putting real mine plans together and real projects together on that because that will be a credible, credible resource at the end of the day. Do I bring in all 10 million ounces? The probability is probably no. I probably bring in seven, eight. If I had a 10 million ounce resource, maybe I bring in more. And, and if I have more than that, maybe I do bring in 10 million. It's going to be a factor of how much of this program we get through uh, at Moss Lake. Uh, and and how how far that we can we can extend it, um, and you know there there you always need to kind of leave some some upside on on the table. I think this project scale uh, at seven or eight or nine million ounces is world class and tier one, and um, and will be very attractive. So I don't have any preconceived ideas. I just know that we're going to be in that tier one status some way, shape, or form however much we bring into a pit shell for the PEA, uh, that'll be determined on, on how we drill and the spacing and the results we get. Um, John's wondering, do you think you are fully funded until the corporate decision in about a year? <clears throat> um, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> I, you can do the simple math and I, I'm, I'll be frank about it. We need about $20 million to get through our program, maybe 22 are we close? Sure we are. Um, but am I going to run this thing down to zero? No. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the market um, later. Um, and I'm not sure it'll be a private placement. It may well be a strategic. It may be something else. Um, it, it won't be, it may not be market accessible. 
Um, so, you know, if we need to put together a small amount of money, uh, we'll do that um, until we get to that corporate decision point. Because after that, we're really looking at what those results are going to be and you know, what the capital is going to be required for us to take it further. And taking it further is a significant commitment. That's probably $25 million a year for two years, or maybe more, maybe $30 million a year for two years. And and that's uh, multiple raises a year for the next two years if we were to continue to do the drilling. So I just don't like to run, certainly in this economic environment and, and capital market environment, I, I don't want to run, I don't want to fly too close to the sun here. So I'll be very cautious and I'll be very um, strategic as to how we do this um, because, you know, I also hate dilution, um, but it's inevitable and uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's one of those things of, of life. Right. Um, and in closing here, unless there's any last minute questions, what does success look like for you and Gold Shore for 2022? Yeah, I think if we can get through our program uh, and, and we can get started on the resource estimation and we're comfortable with what the results look like and we can get through all of our metallurgical test work um, between now and it's already started between now and the fall. So we have all of that data ready and we engage with a, you know, a very, very first class reputable engineering firm to start to prepare all of this work for us. Then, then I, I think that's what success looks. You know, I, I'd love to say our success looks like $2 share price, but all I can control is, is, is the stuff we do on the ground. I, I need to raise the capital for Pete. Pete needs to execute on the ground. We need to kind of get the metallurgical test work done. We need to, you know, we need to be included from ESG standpoint with all of our hosts, whether that be Thunder Bay, whether that be our First Nations and Indigenous communities, whether that be, you know, other stakeholders in our business. Um, that's what we control. We don't control the gold price. We don't control the capital markets. And if our share price is two dollars, uh, that may be that may be that may sound good today, but it may not be a good result. Maybe the market's gone crazy and and we're still lagging. And maybe we're at a dollar twenty, and that's a great result because the rest of the market's behind us. So I don't have the answers to that. So success doesn't look to me in in the form of gold price or share price. Success to me is, is, is it looks like what we what we can control and what we can execute on and getting all that done. Right. Well, thank you so much, Brett, for taking us through the presentation and the Q&A. There's lots of really great comments in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for attending and submitting questions. Of course, if you do think of another question following this summit, feel free to reach out directly to the Gold Shore team. Um, I'm sure Brett will be happy to follow up with you. There's more information, of course, on their website, goldshoreresources.com. And again, you can watch this on six.com. The recording will be up shortly. But Brett, I'll pass it back to you if you just have any final closing remarks. Yeah, Dasha, thanks for this. And, and everyone, thanks for uh, the, the great the great questions and, and, and for sticking by this. Um, you know, we're going to have another one. We're going to do this on a more frequent basis. I find that engaging with everybody kind of a, a, in this type of forum is, is very helpful and very useful. I do this with investors. I do this every day. I have four or five Zoom calls a day. I do this with investors. And I want to do it with, with this audience as well because it gives them the opportunity to hear it from me first, but also hear, uh, uh, ask their questions and get them answered and get straight answers. So anyway, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone. <laughs>